Hello and good evening everybody and welcome to the first in our series of In Conversations in partnership with the Army at the Virtual Fringe. We are so delighted to be involved in this programme and if you haven't seen um, already, and why not, the amazing work the Army and the Arts team are doing, we will be posting a link in the chat where you can go and take part in some of their fantastic workshops. Each week, over the next three weeks, the programme has a different topic. This week is all about film and photography. Have you ever been inspired by a photograph? And have you ever wondered about the story behind it? Here at the National Army Museum, we have a fantastic archive packed full of treasures. We want as many people as possible to be using our archives to learn more about the history of our army and the soldiers who have served in it. As you will hear today, it can be full of surprises. If you have any questions for Wendy or Rob, please post them in the chat question box at the bottom of your screen. And we will put them to, I will put them to both of them at the end of the session. Should we encounter any technical um, difficulties, we pray that we don't, um, please do bear with us whilst we work out how to rectify them. Work out how to rectify them. If your stream cuts out because of the storm, please just press your refresh button and we should come back to you. I will be in the chat to answer any of your questions should you encounter a problem. So um, we are very, very delighted to uh, be joined by the ever wonderful Lieutenant Colonel Wendy Fawkes. That's right. Sorry, I just knew that I was gonna fluff it. It's even more pressure, you know, when you go in live, I don't know why. Having declared at the age of 16 that she wanted to join the army, her fa father told her to have a look at other options rather than following the family's footsteps. She studied graphic design and used photography extensively. Joining the officer training corps reignited her interest in joining the army. After a year with the 3rd Battalion, um, Worcestershire Sherwood Forest. Hang on, my com sorry, <laughs> I do apologize. my computer's just crashed. This is going well. Um, Wendy attended the Royal Military Academy Sandhurst as a turning point in the history of women in the army. She was among the first cohort to commission directly into the regiments, as opposed to the Women's Royal Army Corps. Since Wendy has been in the Territorial Army and subsequently the Reserves, that Wendy became a media specialist in the media and comms, with her first deployment being as part of the combat camera team in the Falklands in 1995. Last year, Wendy took over the role as SO1 Arts Engagement and is currently running this amazing festival for the Army at the Virtual Fringe, which still has two weeks of workshops, so you better start booking in everyone. Can I make a special mention to the program um, on the program that her and her colleague Jordan have put together? It really is jam packed and so, so inspiring. So well done, Wendy. And of course, um, our lovely dear Rob, who is the Templar Study Manager at the National Army Museum and also the museum's public programme's most frequent speaker. We think, although I better start counting, that he has delivered well over 50 talks. Well, we better make it 51 now. Uh, Rob studied law and politics um, and philosophy at the University of Tasmania and the history of history and archaeology at the University of Sydney. He is a keen researcher with particular interest in imperialisms and post-colonial legacy and the military history of the British Empire forces in the World Wars. He has published two books relating to the First World War, a subject that he lectures about regularly and regularly with us. We uh, might give him a week off next week. He is currently writing his third book and is on exploration and espionage in the imperial age and we can't wait to host his book launch. No pressure. Um, so over to you both and I look forward to hearing about how our archive materials can be a catalyst for the next creative project. Hopefully my won't crash. I'm going to disappear and leave you lovely people to it. Thank you very much for that Nicola. Lovely introduction. Um, well, I guess uh, I'll just start by um, mentioning a, a, a few sort of thoughts about uh, the role archives and photos and stuff can play, and then maybe we'll just have some general chat about it. Um, this isn't very structured, so we're just going to um, wing it as we go and see where we get to. Um, I guess one of the things, um, you know, that I'm always struck by 
is how the you know the sort of uh, power of um, what seem like potentially mundane everyday objects to to really um, connect people with history and with emotive stories. You know, and and in particular when you're referring to something like conflict, um, the history of conflict, uh, war is you know one of the most sort of um, you know evocative and recurring subjects throughout history, um, and it's just about affected every different group of people on the planet. Um, and it's really inspired a lot of uh, ways of recalling memory, uh, uh, how people remember conflict and its and its legacy um, through imagery, um, you know, both personal and collective experiences. It's been portrayed in just about every artistic medium, sculpture, writing, tapestry, um, drawings, paintings. Um, and obviously, you know, in the, in the last 150 years or so, 100, 170 years now, really, um, sort of photography, film, television, uh, and most recently the internet. Um, and when you really start looking at um, things like archival material, sometimes it can be really dry and inaccessible and, and not necessarily um, feel that inspiring. But I guess one of the things that we have to remember is that all of these stories are human stories. And um, in particular, um, photography quite often has been created to um, try and really engage people with the, the sort of human aspect of conflict, the human experience. Um, you know, it's very rare that a, an artistic work or a, a photograph has been produced without the um, person who's made that image really wanting people to see that image and understand the experience of the people that were connected to it. Um, and I think those are the sort of things that, you know, um, can really in the in the present day give us inspiration or or um, you know pause for thought or reflection upon the experiences of our forebears. Um, so you know one of the things that um, as the study centre manager at the museum that I'm really keen on is always trying to broaden our audiences, trying to make the collection relevant, trying to make um, you know it more accessible. More people realise that there's great stuff out there, not just in our collections, but obviously our collections are a really wonderful source of this sort of material where people can come, look at things, um, and whatever it is that you're looking for, it doesn't have to be a historical work, it doesn't have to be family history, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be academic, it can be an artistic output. Uh, whatever things you're looking for, there are inspirations to be had there. Um, I don't know, Wendy, if you want to uh, speak to me, uh, speak to us and our audience a little bit about some of the fantastic projects. I know the... Um, you mentioned to me already before about the, the COVID is life thing. Um, maybe you want to um, just give us a bit more background about that sort of thing. Yeah, so um, I, I had a photographic project called Not Just a Wife, and it was looking at military spouses. And it was trying to show the value that is um, within military spouses that we, we just don't see. We, we are the unseen person. We're, we're known as a dependent and we follow people. You know, we follow the serving person around. And, and it was called Not Just Wife, there were men in it, um, but it was deliberately called that because the army is slowly changing to the terminology and that sort of thing. And, um, and we're known as dependents, which is very frustrating. And I just wanted to show that actually these spouses are completely um, have a story of their own. And, um, and, and people were very, it was very funny. I deliberately didn't want to put in uh, anything to do with regiments or um, mm -hmm. military life as such. And people said, well, you, you've you done really well at not ca getting that in. It's all about the, the spouse and the, them as a person. And I said, well, just check the color of the walls. There's all magnolia walls. <laughs> so there is that element, that thread through, you know, we get, we get that magnolia um, walls all in our houses. But from that, I've also then gone on to um, look at uh, the next one is going to be not just a lockdown wife, um, because as the current situation took a hold, many military spouses said um, that the, the lockdown um, life was actually a reflection of what happens to us a lot. You know, we have change, we have instant change and um, we've lost Rob now. So I'm just going to keep going. I shall just and he'll have to catch up. Um, and um, and so I just I just want to show how that life actually um, and what people can learn from it and um, and that sort of thing. But that's slightly taking away from what this is about and how it links into Army at the Fringe. So I, I think 
that um, the archives that people have, and Rob alluded to it, is not just about um, looking at a photograph and doing that family history. Uh, I, I studied um, very badly, but I did study fashion design. And, and I think that it's a source of, um, it's a wealth of source in these old photographs. And the joy of doing something and researching at a place like National Army Museum is that you can find a photograph be inspired by the uniform, and, and then you can go and ask an expert about the, the type of material, the buttons, the, uh, the way that the buttons were worn, and um, that made a difference, I think, in some of the uniforms, I'm sure. Um, and even now, I think, in the Guards regiments, you can tell the regiment because of the pattern of the buttons, whether they're in pairs and, and, and that sort of thing. So there's so much that can be gained from a photograph and it is it's very much like i think very much like a library a lot of people don't understand young people uh, that i've spoken to don't know what a library is they've, they've never been into a library whereas as a child i got lost in a library because i'd find one book and that's why i probably failed my a levels actually because i i would go and I'd find one book and then be distracted because i'd be looking at something else and and i think that's what you know, I think creatives, if they go into an archive, they can get lost in that archive and yeah. and find that story. And even if you pull some story, some photos together, then you get that opportunity. And and if we can bring that on, and it may not even be a, you see a photograph from, from 1800s or whatever, but actually yeah. it, it inspires a story about, I don't know, 2800 or whatever, you know, in the future. Um, but using, you know, if, if you look at everything as a wheel, that things come back round, um, then actually look back and be that person to bring forward and, and, and look at it. So, yeah, I think we need to get people back into the archives. You, you touched on a couple of really interesting things there. I think one of the ones that, um, you know, jumped out at me straight away was um, it's really easy to sort of assume that a military history um, collection or a collection that's primarily military history um, is just about conflict. And in actual fact, really, um, our collection in particular is really rich social history. And it really touches on, you know, every aspect of society, every strata of society. And um, obviously because of the British Army's role in history, um, you know, most parts of the world as well. Um, but you don't even have to necessarily be interested in the army. There's stories that you can find there, whatever you're interested in. Um, you know, the, there's great inspiration for scientific and cultural output. Um, you know, if it's STEM, I, I use the analogy, a lot of people sort of say, oh, well, I'm not really interested in war, or, uh, you know, or I don't like that sort of subject matter. What, what are you interested in? You know, we get people who say, well, what I really love is football. And it's like, well, you know, the army has got this extraordinary um, sporting culture that goes back over it, its entire history, and our collection really reflects that. If you're if you're inspired by football, you can find really great stories about people, footballers from the past, Walter Tull, professional footballer served, or what have you. Um, you know, or engineering. You know, I remember chatting to a young uh, lad once who was looking a little bored while I was talking about a First World War subject, and and I said, "What what really inspires you? What engages you?" And he said, I, I love engines, I love cars. And I said, well, did you, do you realise, you know, the Army's amazing role in the history of engineering, of, of building and advancing machines? And, and all you know, if there's always a subject, and whatever it is, if you can make that reach the person, there's always a way to, to find um, inspiring stories in our collections that they can really engage with. I, th I think that's, that's key. You know, if, if someone has a bit of a, a writer's block or, or doesn't know what they, maybe they want to do something that's a, a historical um, story or or production or something like that. I mean, one of the one of the um, uh, plays we've got coming to the well it was supposed to be at the fringe this year, obviously. Um, but um, Charlotte Green um, spent an awful time, uh, an awful lot of time, researching for her play *Lest We Forget*, which is about a Black British um, soldier serving in World War One. And so he served in World War One, and then was involved in the riots in 1919. But in order to get that authenticity, she had to make sure that she had the right um, regiments and, um, and the right uniforms and all of those sorts of things, which she did through archival research, which then puts that authenticity into her work which will then take us through the story you're not distracted by anything that perhaps is slightly out of place 
it's actually really quite inspiring to see the wide variety um, of people across, you know, an amazing array of um, professions and walks of life who come in and engage with our collections and get something from it. And and I want that to grow. Um, you know, it's everything from the Royal Mint who we've helped to get the details of, um, you know, uh, VE Day uh, coins, the details of the uniform correct through to filmmakers wanting to make sure the uniforms are, are accurate or, um, you know, one of the things I mentioned to you earlier, um, which I found really fascinating and, and and, uh, you know, just sort of sitting back as a historian and watching the different mindset of how people look at the collection um, was this, the fashion project I mentioned. And, um, you know, young fashion designers who have no real obvious interest or no stated interest in military history or campaign history who came in, looked at our photos and our art collections, looked at our uniforms and used that as inspiration for designing, you know, modern 21st century um streetwear fashion and um it's just wonderful to see the wide variety of, of creative responses you can get um you know it, it's easy to put your blinkers on and only see things from one perspective but actually um you know and you know the, the wonderful thing about photography is that you know it does offer fresh perspectives even even when it's old uh, older material I th and, and I was saying earlier when you were reconnecting um, was that actually when you when you find those photographs, the the ability to find the the right staff within the National Army Museum who could then take you through that photograph. Um, so what was the footwear made of? What did they? Um, what was the fabric made of? Uh, you know, the, the sorry, the jackets and everything. So you can actually either be authentic or you can take it to a different one. So yes, it was made of wool, but actually I'm going to change it and and use this fabric um, and I think that um, by using the photographs as well for especially the older photographs I know a lot of people refer to photographs now as a, you know a snap because we've all not all that's wrong a lot of people have um, you know smartphones where you can use your camera on a smartphone um, but there is still something within that photography and we have army photographers deliberately because you still have to engage with the group of people that you're with yeah. and i think that that relevance as well and and as you look at a photograph if you can read a photograph and try and put yourself in the place of the photographer what were they looking at what were they trying to tell us what why did they want to take that photograph and then if you put yourself either as the photographer or as someone who is in the photograph looking back at the photographer you can create and generate so many different ideas and if you just let your mind wander then yeah um, you can be inspired and then from there it's just like right rob i want to see more photos of what did this regiment do or or why were they all in those vehicles and yeah. you can really go for it yeah you, the the inspiration thing i find fascinating and the way the ability for um you know what someone else has done to re-inspire is is something key to what we're getting at um you know uh, in this discussion i think you know ultimately as i said right at the start war has been portrayed right from cave paintings through to the to the instantly uploaded uh, you know mobile phone pick um but the question you you're sort of asking is um why was that taken what is the meaning of it um ultimately particularly in paintings um uh, an artist was always, you know, trying to purvey a particular message. Quite often it was propagandist or flattering or, um, you know, or maybe it is just a historical account of an event, but they are trying to get messages across to you in the, in the work. And when photography was invented, the first um, photographers uh, realised the potential for capturing conflict, um, you know, and it is one of the great human emotive events um, as, as upsetting and, and damaging as it can be, but it is something that's um you know you you do try and empathize with the human experience in conflict and the people who are recording those events are trying to get us to empathize with those events so um you know whatever events uh, major events not necessarily even conflict political events disasters um you know festivals or sporting events wonderful uplifting things as well um you know the the photographer or the artist is trying to purvey or, or portray a message and um you know trying to get into the details of the image and find out what their inspirations were what the meaning behind it was um is revealing and 
um, you know, when you, especially when you're trying to understand an event, um, not looking at the the way it's portrayed and why it was portrayed um, is a is a vital clue that you're missing. You need to look at the writing, who wrote about it, who were they, what what was their relationship with the events, were they neutral or were they you know connected to the participants, um, and the same thing goes with the, with the photographer. Um, ultimately, uh, quite a lot of the early conflict photography um, was uh, you know trying to portray a particular message, be it you know, pro-British propaganda um, or, or um, you, know, you know, genuinely trying to purvey a bit of human empathy. I think, you know, some of the early works of um, the likes of sort of Roger Fenton and James Robertson, Felix uh, uh, Beato, John McCat, John McCosh, who um, captured some of the events, uh, early conflicts in the Punjab in Burma, China, um, the Indian Mutiny uh, or Rebellion, the, the work that they um, captured um, is really telling in why, what inspires people. I think, you know, um, John McCosh in particular, his, his photographs show fellow officers, but also their family members. It's about the experience of being in the conflict, not just what the soldiers are doing. Um, he shows images of the local people, the architecture, um, and the aftermath of battle, which I think, you know, you can only really be uh, trying to show what the experience of those involved was. One of, one of the books, actually, that I was inspired by, so when I did my exhibition, not just... ...so wife, um, um, someone, a colleague, work colleague, got in touch. Uh, this is a book written by his grandmother, and um, and it is just stunning because um, Veronica Banfield's husband was a photographer, so he documented military life, family life, um, and, um, and then she recalls um, a lot of the... Um, stories in, in, in her book, in her diaries, um, but it's the photographs that, that grab you. Mm. Now, another, another one, you were talking about the Punjab. Um, we had, uh, two years ago, um, the troth um, was brought to us by Academy, and it was a um, World War One folk tale from the Punjab. And what they did was they used um, photography as a projection. Mm. And and I think that that is something as well that if artists are looking for a way of putting you into a situation, um, you can use that projection. And they used it beautifully. I think you, you can't just have it as an add-on. It has to be part of the, the show. But it meant that when they were doing the market scene, you had these photographs, these black and white photographs from World War One of market scenes projected on the back and you were just in there with them um, and and that creating that scene setting works brilliantly but I suppose the question is where do people start how, how do you how would you start to look for something like that you you mentioned something there which I found quite interesting and actually I think it's unpicking um, you know that inspiration aspect a little bit more and and you're talking about the the power of the black and white image um, you know, a lot of people assume that black and white photography persisted um, for as long as it did because of technological limitations. But the the vast majority um, of, of the first photographs were monochrome. But actually, colour photography was developed quite early on. The very first colour photographs were taken in the 1860s using just three colour um, filtration of black and white images. So, you know, they knew how to make colour photos in the 19th century. And actually, black and white photography persisted for a very long time because it became what people expected of a photograph. And it also became an artistic medium that they respected. They wanted uh, to experiment with light and colour. And I think particularly, it seems strange to us now because um, one thing I find is that young people in particular relate to colour photography better than black and white. But for the earliest uh, re uh, recorders of, of photography, they were inspired by the sort of starkness of the black and white photographs that they took. I have to say, even when I was in um, Bosnia in '95 as a part of the combat camera team, I had two cameras. One had colour film in and one had black and white film in, mainly because the black and white film was easier to develop when yeah. you were in the middle of nowhere and you, you hadn't got to rely on. I remember being on... Um, it was a race for to get the Remembrance Day parade. There was a team up on Mount Igman and we were down near Mostar or somewhere and um, it was a race to get it back to the UK. But we were in places where you couldn't guarantee and you had the, the electricity and you had to keep the temperature right for the colour photos and you spent most of your time just doing that, um, but we lost. That, that's absolutely fascinating because, um, 
you know, even as photography technology in the in the 19th century was developing, one of the really, um, you know, limiting experiences, particularly in places like the Crimean War, was the fact that they had to fix their negatives on a glass plate. Um, you know, the wet plate method had major drawbacks. The photographer basically had to take a dark room with them wherever they went. So for the early war photographers, um, you know, deciding how to develop their film was actually a major limitation. And you've just described an event, you know, 140 odd years later, um, which was is is, an, is a shared experience in some ways. And wasn't it? I can't remember the. Oh, I've gone blank now. But the, one of the films was inspired. One of these recent epic war films, whether it's Band of Brothers or something. Someone might help us out in the chat. Or I don't know if you know. Which was inspired by the series of initial beach landing photos because they were very limited number. I mean, I remember reading a Robert Capper book, and them and, and him saying that he sent a whole load of films back, but they developed them wrong. So I think, I think it is Band of Brothers, and I think. From memory, I haven't watched it for a little while, but I think from memory, they actually recreate uh, the existing photos with some of the some of the actors. I think from in yeah. the starting credits. Yeah, that is, that is it is fascinating. Um, you know that that in itself is another great story. You mentioned Kappa, um, and and I saw a comment. We can touch on official photography a bit more and answer the question directly. But I saw something flash past about official photography. Um, the the very first photos that were taken in conflicts. Um, certainly in terms of sort of British experience, um, were uh, not official. They were sort of, um, you know, John McCosh's photos of the Anglo-Sikh wars. But already the power of the image uh, to portray the experience of conflict was, um, you know, sort of uh, appreciated within a decade. So by the Crimean War, just 10 years later, um, uh, Roger Fenton is actually sent to the Crimea as an official war photographer. So he is representing the government. And actually, for a long time, they were very resistant to allowing private or commercial photographers anywhere near. And certainly, you know, other ranked soldiers, they, they were very reluctant, especially at wartime, to allow them to make their own photography. And it was quite strictly censored and, and um, at times punishable, uh, banned and punishable. Um, and yet soldiers wanted to record their experience. The box brownie camera was a great liberator. Um, you know, soldiers could sort of sneak one in their personal kit and, and took some of the most inspiring historical photos that we still have, um, you know, as, as records of their human experiences. Um, but by the Second World War, and you, you mentioned Kappa, um, you know, the, the value of the f photograph to portray specific messages is really understood. So whereas photographers were, were sort of, tried to be prevented from getting anywhere near the Western Front. By the Second World War, um, you know, they're being embedded in units and you're getting some um, famous Life and Time magazine photographers basically right up at the front line, really capturing the, the sort of nitty gritty of the experience of combat. Uh, combat. But I think with, with Anne's question about the official photographers, I, one of the things that I'm really keen on, and I know that we we've done, um, I did uh, several exhibitions back in Germany where we um, asked the soldiers to put forward their photographs. And in Estonia, we, there, there was a, a recent exhibition about what, what do soldiers feel about their, their job and their, how they feel about their deployments and things like that. And I think that's, that's really important because um, you, you get the official photographs but that essence of what it was really like or what it is really like are those photographs of um, soldiers messing around. I mean, I've got some of my father and my grandfather. Um, in fact, you know, here, here's one of, of my, my grandfather. Um, it just looks like he's having a, a, a lovely pint of beer and that sort of thing. But mm. actually, that's in the Kiel officer's mess. And then when I served in Germany, I can go up to Kiel and try and find and locate where this was but i think it's really important that we do capture and and don't forget these sort of the casual photographs as yeah well. absolutely so much when you look at our collections in particular um one of the things which i i find really interesting um and i think you know getting back to Anne's question again um we do have examples of official photography in our collection um probably iwm's got more of that than us but we do have examples of it um, but one thing that our collection is particularly strong on is private collections and donated albums and that sort of thing. And those are hugely telling when you're looking for what inspired a person to make photographs. Um, some of them, um, you know, they're clearly trying to record their experiences in a conflict and others, um, you know, it happens to be someone with a scientific or cultural pursuits who has found themselves having an army career or been, you know, 
perhaps conscripted to to a, a major war or something of that sort. Um, and the photography that they're inspired by, yes, it records their experiences of conflict, um, but actually they're clearly more inspired by the the local architecture or the amazing geography or and you know some of them are essentially travel logs exactly the sort of thing that maybe someone might today have as a facebook album of of their trip abroad or what have you um and so you know that really opens up a little bit of understanding about the humanity involved in the in the creation of those images and, and karen's put it straight it was um saving private ryan oh yeah right yeah. Those, those big epics <laughs> came out that we need to revisit yeah <laughs> Exactly. Um, yeah, our collection, um, you know, I, I will, since I just mentioned it, I will just expand on that slightly. Um, you know, if people want to know what sort of material we hold, we have actually over 10,000 different separate photographic collections. Some of them vary from one or two images through to albums of four or 500 um, images. Uh, some actually chart, you know, the majority of an individual's career or what have you. So in total, it's, you know, the best part of a quarter of a million photographs. Wow. Um, and they literally cover everything from those uh, first conflicts in the mid 19th century all the way up to what we now refer to sort of as born digital or native digital images um, taken by mobile phones of guys in Afghanistan um, uh, and uh, only existing in, uh, in, a, in a sort of ethereal digital form that never been printed, in fact. Um, you know, everything from John McCosh's photos of India um, through to um, Dr. Uh, Hilton Girdwood's 3D stereoscopes from the First World War. People forget that people were experimenting with stereoscope, uh, stereoscopic photos in the 19th and early 20th century. Um, there's amazing stereoscopes of the Franco, uh, sorry, um, Russo-Japanese War, the Boer War, the First World War, and using modern 3D TVs or what have you, you can turn them into 3D imagery. Um, and you know, just for example, people were saying uh, someone was asking whether. You know, it's sort of personal experience. Um, you know, one one of our great recent acquisitions, or a couple of years ago, was major sales, absolutely remarkable output of some two thousand photos from the Second World War. Um, you know, he charted more or less his daily uh, experience from the the landings at Normandy all the way through to entering Germany, and it's just the most remarkable, extraordinary piece of output. I I, I really want to see more people coming into museums and looking through these archives you know just sort of getting lost in in that space um how do you think we can encourage people to to come in and and to actually use the archives yeah i i, I just can't emphasize enough um when, when i started i mean i've been working at the national Army museum over 13 years now and um when i started doing it you know the study room felt a little bit like the domain of the academic um, it was a, a fairly off-putting place for some people, perhaps if they weren't very experienced with um, study or research. And I just want to really break that down and, and emphasize as much as possible that, it, you know, we're a welcoming place, we're an incredibly friendly place. We pride ourselves on our sort of accessibility and customer service. Um, you know, we want the story of our army. And when we say that, we mean all of the people who've um, served with British forces going back uh, throughout history across the former empire, the Commonwealth, um, you know, our, our um, expatriate communities abroad and our um, migrant communities here in the UK, our collection is relevant and connected to all of their stories and the contributions that, you know, Africans, Asians, um, people from the Americas, the Caribbean, um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the, the former dominions, all of those places are connected to our stories. And whatever it is that you're personally interested in, we've got stuff that's interesting to you. So. Um, get in touch, um, send us an email, drop, well, we can't drop in at the moment, but, um, you know, normally we welcome people just to drop in. You can certainly make an appointment to come and look around the galleries, look for inspiration, um, look at our online inventory and see what materials we have. Um, and whatever subject matter you're interested in, I assure you there's going to be stuff that you'll uh, be able to look for inspiration from. What if, what if somebody has found a photograph at home? Um, you know, during this lockdown, lots of people have had a bit of time to tidy up or, or go into the attic where they haven't been for a wee while. Um, and they find a photograph um, of a relative or, well, just a photograph. You, you probably don't know if it's a relative or not. Um, how can they find out more about it? What's the best way of, of sort of investigating a photograph? We absolutely welcome uh, inquiries of that sort. We get a lot of them. Um, you know, we are quite expert at it. Um, so if you've got one, uh, the worst thing that can happen is you send us a, a digital copy of it and we're not sure. 
Um, but actually, quite often, you know, we're fairly expert at looking for those little hidden clues um, that you can really uh, turn a photograph from what you might think is just an image into a piece of evidence. And I mentioned to you before, it's a similar sort of process to what a detective would do. You're looking for little clues. Um, I always encourage people when they're doing family history to create a timeline. And when you're using a timeline, um, you can put a known date or a known place or a newspaper article or a, a wedding or a wedding invite that you have in an album or what have you. And you'll find that when you start to sequence them and contextualize those little bits of evidence, they actually can support each other. So for example, you might find that there was a, a wedding invite um, for someone getting married in, I don't know, Bombay or something like that. And all of a sudden you've got in the photo album, a whole bunch of sunny and nice pictures. You know, you can start to deduce from that, that probably that little section of the photo album is when they were abroad at the wedding or something like that. And you're just looking for little clues in the images. Um, be it a name on the back or the name of a photography studio where someone got a portrait studio done or, um, you know, is it details in the uniform? Uh, one of the key things people want to know is what regiment their ancestor served in. So if we can find a cap badge or a collar badge or a flourish in the uniform, and actually when you start to look at um, some of the details in uniforms, you get some really basic clues um, which can actually help you pin down where on that timeline something belongs to. Um, in fact, I've got a couple of pictures if I, I'll try and quickly uh, see. Uh, this could go badly wrong, but I'm going to try and share this and see if it works um, just to sort of illustrate what I've just been describing. Hopefully this isn't going to stop everyone from being able to see um, what I'm looking at. Um, so this basically is um, some photos from our collection just to give you some idea. Um, this first one, for example, um, we, we can look at the basic details and sort of see this is the typical coatee of the first half of the um, 19th century. So you can tell that it's going to be an image from that period. But obviously, as we discussed earlier, there isn't really any photography from before the mid 1840s. So the likelihood we're looking at here is probably this is a photo from the Crimea. Um, just skipping forward a little bit, this these images, can you see these, Wendy, by the way? Are they showing yeah. up? Yeah, no, yeah. they're yeah. Um, so, so for example, if we're looking at this one, we've got a group shot. There's um, sort of typical uh, army tents in the background, probably something like a an order shot camp or a you know a training exercise. Our our guys there are wearing the um, Prussian style helmet, which was introduced post Franco Prussian War. So it's in the the darker blue color of the home service helmet. So it's a photo in the UK, and we can tell that um, you know it's going to be roughly the sort of maybe uh, 1870s period and here in the UK. Whereas this one, for example, you can tell they're still wearing the red tunics, um, but they've got the, the white foreign service helmet. So it's likely going to be abroad, probably somewhere in Southern Africa, judging from the sort of tree um, and the environment, the grassland, etc. cetera. Um, this one, so khaki uh, introduced in India post uh, 1878, the war white before this date. So almost certainly a, um, a unit out serving in India. By this, this one, we sort of can look at things like the service dress uniform, but it's the closed collar variation rather than the shirt and tie. Um, he has got a Sambran belt and putties, likely pre-First World War, but potentially close to the outbreak of the war. Um, and, and here again, obviously sort of First World War style. They're in a defensive situation like a, a trench um, or a cutting of some sort. Um, but again, officer's service dress, wearing a Brody helmet, they weren't introduced to the end of 15 um, and rolled out early 16, really. Um, but his ranks moved from his cuff to his epaulette. So that's probably 1917. So it's just looking at those sort of little details. Um, am I back? Yes, you are. Good. Um, I, I don't know if dark in here. I need to turn the light on. Um, yeah, it's uh, just looking at those sort of little details and being able to figure out um, what clues you can get and then adding that to the existing evidence um, and hopefully from that you can build a, a picture which gives you a fuller story and it's it's really fascinating when you sort of look at you know a photo just off the cuff and don't really pay attention to the details um, you sort of think oh it's a photo of a soldier it's it's easy to do that or it's easy to look at a letter and think it's a letter home from something there's not much detail there um, but when you fit all the clues together, like making a puzzle, all of a sudden it gives you actually a lot of detail and a lot of uh, sometimes inspiring stories come out of that. So we've got BJ Day coming up this weekend. What? How? How does your collection reflect that? Have you got the? You know, a lot of um, films I remember seeing. You know, had these glamorous parties that started off and then 
there was the invasion in, in various places. Mm. Um, but what's what sort of um, photographic evidence have you got? Do you want to turn your light on? I was about to say, I might just turn the light on because I can't see myself anymore. So bear with me. <laughs> okay. Well, it's a bit like a big Doctor Who chair or something. That hey, there we go. Apologies, I'm back. Much better. Much nah. better. Now we can see. Yeah, that. Um, VJ Day. Uh, yeah, you know, it's an interesting one, really, because um, the geographical distance to the far uh, to the far east to East Asia um, meant that um, obviously, you know, uh, here in the UK there were um, huge amounts of photos being taken, press photos, personal photos of events at home, the home front in particular, and obviously that included events like the Blitz, um, the bombing of um, British cities uh, all over the UK. Um, and uh, the majority of our war efforts, they very deliberately focused on trying to defeat Germany first. Um, so that obviously also meant the attention of war photographers. Plus, we need to bear in mind that actually in the early stages of the war in um, Asia, um, it hadn't gone very well for the Allies. And so we do have some photos of the defence of Hong Kong, for example, before it was invaded in uh, December 41. Um, and we also have some photos of the Japanese entering Hong Kong. Um, uh, but actually, there's a little bit of a, a, a gap in many uh, in many regards because um, after the fall of Singapore, the war effort was on the back foot, um, and uh, you know the emphasis, certainly the British emphasis, sort of shifts to um, uh, Burma. Um, the Allies uh, have the Asian conflict divided into sort of three main sectors: the Central Pacific is the American Marines' focus, Southwest Pacific is a sort of a joint um, Australian, Dutch, and American effort, and then and then you sort of have uh, China, Burma, India, et cetera, which Britain, uh, Indian, Chinese troops um, uh, uh, focused on. Actually, one area of our collection which uh, is great is we've got some really inspiring photos of the West African troops who served in Burma, um, and that's a, a really wonderful collection. Um, so there, there are, um, in particular, a lot of images in terms of sort of VJ Day of the latter stages of the war in that area rather than um, the earlier stages. But we do have some great inspiring photos. Um, and in particular, I would say, you know, if, if you're wanting to learn more about um, African involvement in uh, the war in Burma, some of those images are actually really quite powerful and moving. I know. I was just saying to Isabel, behind the scenes, Rob, what was that album we found as part of our VJ research? And it was the West African Frontier. Yeah. And I yeah. mean, some of them photos are just, in, they're so incredible. It, it's truly extraordinary. I mean, the West African Division, essentially one of their great strengths were um, their ability to move vast amounts of supply just by manpower. They didn't have a lot of pack animals. And in actual fact, they were um, so fit and strong. They had such great endurance. They were able to move over vast areas of terrain. And actually that was, um, you know, a really decisive factor in their ability to conduct that campaign. And Isabel's just put in the chat that many of these images will be displayed throughout our VJ75 programme um, that we started today that goes across the whole of the weekend. But one of the things in particular, um, we've done it in conversation with uh, Private Joseph Hammond and Captain Sir Tom Moore. And just as you were saying, um, Rob, about, you know, he was in the 82nd uh, West African Division and yeah, I mean, it is just so incredible. And when we showed him some of these images that we have in our collection, he was just, you know, it brought it all all back for him. Yeah. And yeah. he's like, you know, it feels as though I'm there, you know, and I can, all those memories are coming back. It's as clear as day. And, you know, he is 96, 97. And how incredible he, and, you know, his descriptions of things um, was as clear as a photograph. Um, the other thing I was just going to add in is when I worked um, with the Household Cavalry, and I will get to some of these questions in a minute, um, at the museum, they have the Christina Broom um, collection, a uh, part of it, and she was, was she the first female um, photographer that went off to photograph the army. I'm sure someone will tell me I'm wrong, but I'm sure she was the first female because she also um, photographed the suffragettes and the Museum of oh, London right. had a fantastic collection. But some of her photography that she took before the soldiers went off to the front. And I mean, it was just, um, some of, it was just so, so incredible. And um, some of the photos in, in that archive. Um, so yeah. some, sorry, go on. 
And I was going to ask, do, do you take, sort of, if someone finds an album or finds some photographs, do you take, sort of, family, that those personal photographs, would you add them to your collection? Absolutely. Um, you know, um, we, we receive regular donations, and it's a huge, uh, important part of um, how we collect in our, in our collecting policy. Um, obviously, you know, everything's considered uh, on, its, on its merit sort of thing, but if it's reflective of the history of experience of soldiers who've served with the British Army or, or British Colonial Commonwealth Forces uh, prior to independence, um, then that's within our collecting remit. Um, mm. And we receive regular donations and, and it enriches our collection in a, in a hugely important way. And in fact, one of the things that really sets our collection apart, as I briefly touched on earlier, um, you know, is that it is it does tend to be personal albums and personal photographs uh, as opposed to sort of more official stuff. Um, so if anyone's considering that, uh, the other thing I would add is always uh, bear in mind if, if people are unsure, you know, obviously we have a professional archive, we have an environmentally controlled store, um, photos can be looked after and cared for, um, you know, in our museum probably better than they can in a, in a private home. Mm. Um, and it's a national collection. It belongs to the people. It can always be accessed. Anyone, if they're worried about future generations uh, not being able to see their photos or what have you, they can come down to the Temple of Study Centre from now to per perpetuity um, and view those images. And we generally, if anyone sends us a request to say, oh, my grandfather's photos are in your collection, can I have a copy? We'll always send them out. So. I'm just going to pop to some of these questions because you have answered some of them um, between both of you, but I'm just going to go over one of them because it touches on what you were just talking about because Anne was asking that you were talking a lot about the official photographers, but do we hold um, amateur photos too? So I know you have answered that briefly, but if you could just touch on it again, that would be great. We our, our, our collection of photographs runs the whole gamut. So we do have examples of official photography we have an example of press photography, um, but I would say this, the strength, the real strength of our collection is actually private photos. So um, we have, you know, a large number of albums um, and everything from high-ranking officers through to privates um, and uh, from everything from sort of John McCosha stuff in the, in the 19th century through to um, we do have born digital images that are only accessible. Um, they only either exist on CD. Briefly, they'll put on CDs. That's already disappeared as a technology, and now we get you know like digital, digital stuff on the internet just sent through. So absolutely every format um, in every period, um, and most conflicts covered. But if there's anything in your family collections that you think you know is relevant and interesting, um, do do get in touch. I know, Rob, it's funny that I work with you and we work so closely together, let alone I have all of these amazing photos in my family album, which, as Wendy said, I did go through. I'm not lockdown. worried about when this is arriving on my desk. <laughs> I'm going to have to my back catalogue and get you to, to start going through them and then I'll be going off to the Army Record Office to get all the <laughs> of all these people that I don't know. Um, so we're getting a lot of, lot of questions about how people can access so Andrew's asked a fantastic question saying, are all of the NAM images available online or do you have to physically attend the NAM to, to view the images? If images are available online, is the collection searchable? Uh, they're not yet, um, but it is a process that we're, uh, we're constantly adding to. All of our collection is searchable. We have an online inventory, which you can find through our website. Um, I'm sure Isabel will do some magic and put that on the internet somewhere there for you to look at. Um, it's oh, there it is. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's all searchable via the inventory. The short answer is we have a huge collection. The, the collection of the National Army Museum comprises over 1.3 million objects. Um, so we regularly digitise, we regularly photograph material and add it to the internet uh, to our um, online collection on a regular basis but it will take, um, you know, some time to get through our whole photographic collection. So, you know, at some point in a few years down the line, hopefully it will all be visible. But at the moment, um, if they're viewable, when you find them on the inventory, you can click on the on the hyperlink and it will take you through to a digitised image. If it hasn't yet been digitised at the moment, the way to do that is come and visit me in the Temple of Study Centre and I'll be very friendly and welcoming and get the photos out for you. Oh, you are lovely, Rob. Um, someone else is asking, um, Anne again, saying, do we liaise with places like regimental museums, the Imperial War Museum and the National Archive? Yeah, and our, our fellow forces museums, the uh, Royal Air Force and the Museum of the Royal Navy. 
Um, you know, we're, we're all uh, colleagues. We have a good working relationship. In fact, this VJ Day event uh, program has been put it, uh, together in partnership with the our friends at the uh, Navy and Air Force Museum. Um, the regimental museums, we have a very strong relationship. In fact, we have a member of staff whose um, primary role is our regimental liaisons officer, and um, we help them out with collections management training, um, with uh, historic research. We've put on exhibitions with them in the past. Um, you know, we occasionally loan objects between and, you know, back and forth between us um, and we help them out wherever we can. So, yes, our friends in the Regimental Museums are very close with us and, um, you know, we, we definitely work very strongly and, and uh, hand in hand with them. Karen has asked a fantastic question. I'm dying to know what your answer is going to be, Rob. She said, um, have you come across anything in the collections that has given you the real wow factor when you first saw it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of amazing stuff. Um, wow. Uh, I guess I think one of the things is when you look at an object and realise um, that it, it is a physical, tangible part of, you know, key major historical events, not just in British history, but humanity. Um, so, for example, one thing that jumps out straight away is uh, with, with appropriate object handling and gloves and all the rest of it, but um, picking up and holding one of Napoleon's actual French eagles, which was carried in, you know, the, the Napoleonic Hundred Days, um, the events of Waterloo, those sorts of things. Um, but, th you know, th there are so many other examples in our collection. Do go on our inventory and, and dig around. Um, but you just sort of think, wow, when you're a kid, you read about these stories about far gone historical events that are, people you've never met they're just names and dates in books and then you pick up physical objects related to them and you just like it's real they were real people um they were real events they've changed the world they've changed history um and you know that's, well, that's, that's we, that so exciting Rob, isn't it that's what makes us throw our legs we, out in the morning <laughs> that's what we why we do what we do because you know those things are relevant they're connected to us they uh, the reason why the world is the way it is today. And, um, yeah, it is that they're inspiring objects, yeah. I was just going to say that one of the things that, um, one of the wow factor things that I loved, and it was the first time that um, the museum, in recent years, I know we held it years ago, Rob, we held the Army Photographic uh, Competition um, exhibition winners. Yeah. And the wow moment for me, and Wendy had her on Army in the Arts earlier this week, was, um, is it Corporal Rebecca Brown? Yeah. Becky Brown. Yeah. I have to share this image for people that have not seen it. This is probably going to go terribly wrong, but I'm going to try. This image was one of the um, winning um, images in her portfolio um, yeah. when she won the Army uh, Photographic Competition of the year 2019 this year. And I mean... I think everyone can agree with me what a stunning um, image it is. It is just absolutely beautiful and very moving. Um, Wendy, do you want to tell us a little bit about your chat with her earlier this week? Yeah, it, it was great. So um, Becky Brown, um, she was talking about this this image as well and saying how that drip of blood, She first of all, she said it, it looked, she'd put too much in into it. and um, and it's it's almost about she was talking about how taking elements out of a photograph can actually have more impact, and just that single trickle um, was sufficient to to give that message across. Um, she's an amazing lady. She has been um, she's photographed in Afghanistan, um, in the Falklands, all over the world. Um, but she was saying that one thing she wants to do is Norway. She wants to go. She was part of the um, Ice Maidens, and um, she did the training up in the Arctic for oh, wow. the Ice Maidens. Uh, she didn't get through to the final selection, but she did the ice dunking wow. stuff and everything else. But she now wants to go back and and photograph that. Yeah. Um, and and I think that um, it, it's her journey from being an amateur photographer and how she took photographs she, she was a medic to begin with because you can't join the army straight as a as a photographer you have to join as a soldier and then you will then develop those skills and and you can get picked up by the army photographic um trade and then you will get trained in different sort of 
were, were trained on your cameras and and then it's up to you to be creative and and i i think the the joy for me is when i work with photographers army photographers um you say Look, this is my output it's got to be for um we're aiming for the front page of the times or we're aiming for front cover of a magazine but this is the story and it's about that storytelling and this tells this photograph is just tells the story um in yeah. several different ways and I, just, I just find it so extraordinary just the the ability of people to be creative and the different outputs um uh the, the the army photographic competition that Nicola mentioned before, um, you know, we hosted that uh, back in the 2000s and um, I, I had the pleasure of managing to uh, be involved in hanging uh, quite a lot of those images on the walls for the duration that we hosted it. It disappeared from us for a little while while we were renovating the museum and what have you, but um, very, very happy personally to have it back uh, um, in recent times and hopefully we can keep hosting it. Um, but, it's, you know, I remember even back uh, over 10 years ago, just the extraordinary range of images, the different styles and types of photography, um, what inspires people. We were talking about where you get your inspiration from. It's just truly, um, you know, moving how people are motivated by either trying to capture empathy or, or emotion or, you know, personal experience. Some of them are actually clearly trying to portray the, the, the serious physical hardship or endurance or, or um, discomfort um, or, you know, whatever it is. But... Um, the power of an image made by a skilled photographer to portray human experience, um, it, it's never-ending in the inspiration that that gives, yeah. I think one of the interesting things as well, I think, um, going back to that question about official photography versus amateur, I think that it's, so as, a, as someone who's worked on a combat camera team, and sometimes my photographer wasn't around, so I ended up having to take the photographs, um, is that the army doesn't tell you Mm. take they tell you what the story is or the, the the message that they want to get across and then they leave it up to the photographer's creativity and that is what is so important and having a range of photographers who have different styles and will interpret in a different way is is you get that um that the, all those different photographs you don't get a sort of a stock style of, of photography yeah. and we're always encouraging them to be as creative as possible and you know you can go to events and you you can see soldiers uh, and and as a photographer you've got to dress in the same way especially in london the same way that whoever is on parade is dressed yeah but then there's poor photographers you watch them with their beautifully polished boots trying to get on the ground and <laughs> take a photograph and think, a different angle and you think those poor Hanging up a gantry or something. <laughs> horse guards parade uh, when i when i worked at horse guards and um, i've seen a few troop in the colors of uh, when the queen goes around in the cam uh, the carriage and they're on the floor or you know on the podium and they're on the floor trying to get the best shot of the soldiers march past and it is so bonkers climbing up poles this you name it they're there just to get the best shot and some of that is just incredible as well well we're shortly coming up um to well we are we're now at an hour um so we're gonna have to draw the event to a close but before we go wendy i know it's going to be really hard for you to pick just a couple of events um that you're really looking forward to within the next couple of weeks at the army at the virtual fringe but if you could just plug um one or two to our audience what would they be and what would you ask them to look out for uh i think lest we forget um because i think it tells a really good story it's one that we we shouldn't forget and and that is the black british soldiers that has served with the british army for much longer than than I think um, British history documents at the moment, and, and Charlotte is bringing that right to the fore. And, and these are um, subjects that we can bring, and hopefully, it will inspire people to move the story on as well, and to look at more to do with that Black British history and really demonstrate it. Um, and I think that's fabulous, whether it's to do with the army or not. You know, it, it's she is using the army because, she, because that's um, her father was in the army. And so she has that lifestyle. Um, so that that's one that's really good. Um, I'm actually looking forward to the um, the military musicians have got a, a night that they have to themselves, where it's be behind the marching band, and wow. it's the mu army musicians who play in all our marching bands. But actually, it's showing themselves at home 
and their own music, their own compositions, the songs that they sing, um, and how they've um, been on deployments and just created songs and composed in the moment to reflect what the soldiers have been going through during that day and you know and how they support soldiers and things like that so that one i think will be fascinating i mean they're just all so incredibly talented as well they're musicians we had some of them come and um, play at the museum for one of our late night events and it was just incredible i mean i was hoping that we weren't going to get any complaints from the neighbors because it was quite loud um, <laughs> it was just remarkable so i will definitely um look up that one and i really do hope that we can um hopefully host less we forget in the museum so some of our um uh, audience members can come along and enjoy it hopefully in person um in months to come um the pensioners in the hospital make more noise than we do <laughs> we love the pensioners they're, they're absolutely brilliant um but thank you, uh, Wendy. It's an absolute pleasure always to see you. And, you know, we do talk for hours usually off the screen. I mean, it's fair to say that we can talk for hours on the screen as well. And Rob, I mean, you're just wonderful and you know that anyway. So um, it has been a real pleasure. And I'm going to dig out all of my photos and bring them into work. So <laughs> Rob's got that. To do. I'm talking I'm mine out now. We're moving house in, in three weeks' <laughs> time. So, you know. <laughs> I think I'm here, here as well. It's getting we, a bit dark. We aim to help however we can. <laughs> well, thank you, Brilliant. everyone. I hope you've enjoyed the evening. Please spread the word um, to everyone that you know, not only just about the National Army Museum and our absolutely fantastic archives and the wonderful members of staff there that run them, but also about the Army at the Virtual Fringe um, because it is an incredibly inspiring programme um, that you should all, you know, it's all free, that you can access it um, at home, um, during this, um, well, not lockdown, but who knows what's happening, do we? I mean, anyway, take care. Creative. Yes, yep. get creative and be inspired by all these wonderful people in the British Army um, and not in the British Army, because it's just uh, just really, really incredible. Um, so I hope you all stay safe well and hope the storms don't um, disrupt all your internet connections this evening but do take care and we hope to see you um, at the National Army Museum again soon and um, book a ticket online and do come and see us take care everyone bye for now bye thank you <laughs>